Right guys, welcome to the lesson on bone types and functions. Um, we will look a little bit towards the end of the video about bone remodeling and we'll get to that shortly. But before we do that, five types of bone um, that you'll need to know. Um, and the first type of bone, or the first classification if you like, of bone uh, is long bones. And these are just bones that are longer than they are wide. Um, classic sort of cartoon looking bone um, with, a, with a shaft in the middle and then two bulky extremities. Um, that shaft, the technical term for that is the diaphysis and then the bulky extremities at either end. Uh, the technical term for that is epiphysis or epiphyses, it's the plural. And between the epiphysis and the diaphysis, uh, between the bulky ends and the shaft of the bone, we have a growth plate um, or epiphyseal plate. And that is, as the name suggests, where the growth of the bone occurs throughout early life until eventually the bone um, essentially stops growing and the growth plate essentially becomes kind of defunct. It doesn't really do any more growing after a certain age once you get into sort of your early 20s or thereabouts for most people. Inside the diaphysis, inside the bone shaft, is a cavity. So it's hollow in there um, and it's filled with not bone uh, but bone marrow. Um, and bone marrow is that stuff that you feed to your dogs. Um, it's red or it's yellow bone marrow. Um, and it's there to produce, amongst other things, red blood cells. Um, so we can see from the structure and, and what the, um, the content of the bone is, we can ascertain some of the functions of the bone. We can work out what the functions are by looking at the diagram, for example. Um, and the first function is leverage. That is, these long bones, because they're long, we have attachments of muscle at either end. Um, it enables us to move the skeleton around. So when the muscles pull and pull on the skeleton via the tendons, because we've got long bones, it enables movement um, of, of the skeleton. And the second thing, like I've just mentioned, is that it's where blood cells are produced, red and white blood cells are produced in the medullary cavity because that's where the marrow is. Best examples will be the femur, uh, the top of the leg, upper leg, um, and the humerus, which is in the upper arm. Second type of bone, um, moving on from long bones is short bones and short bones are bones that are roughly cube shaped that is basically they're not longer in any particular axis like a long bone is um, they're roughly cube shaped no no not much longer any particular direction whichever way around you turn them and their main function is weight bearing um, so we find these particularly in the ankles and in the wrists. If you think about what your ankles go through in terms of um, walking, running, jumping, um, the the amount of weight that has to be borne by those bones is pretty significant. Um, and so therefore they need to be pretty compact, pretty strong, um, and, and they tend to be quite small as well by comparison. So those are short bones. Flat bones um, tend to be thin bones. They are flattened, um, hence the name. But in spite of the name, are actually usually ever so slightly curved. And that's depending on their particular place in the skeleton. Essentially, the function of a flat bone is for protection. It's to, when there's an impact on that flat bone, because it's broad and flat, that impact is spread out. So the pressure of the impact doesn't immediately damage what's beneath the bone, but the but the pressure is dissipated. It's it's spread out over the bone um, to kind of absorb the shock of being um, of, ha of an impact or being hit or whatever. So so therefore, best examples again of flat bones would be the cranium. So the bones that make up the skull, and there's 22 of those you'll remember from a previous video, uh, and also the bones that make up the sternum, um, the breastbone. And so you can think immediately what it is that's being protected by the cranium and what it is that's being protected by the sternum. Next type of bone is a very special kind of bone, um, which has a particular name that you'll just have to learn. And that is a sesamoid bone, a sesamoid bone. Um, and a sesamoid bone is a special kind of bone because it's a bone that is embedded inside a tendon. So the example that you've got on the screen there is the patella in the knee. Um, and the patella is embedded into the patella tendon. 
which runs down from the thigh, from the quadriceps, down in um, into the front of the shin, um, into the tibia, the little top of the tibia. Um, so, so that patella there that you can see on the on the picture on the screen is an example of a sesamoid bone, and its purpose essentially um, partly protection, but mainly to reduce friction. Um, across a joint in that it, it sort of lifts up the tendon up and away from where it would rub against the front of the bones there of the knee so it kind of lifts that tendon away and thereby reduces friction so you get less inflammation less soreness less pain because of the presence of a sesamoid bone and the last type of bone that you'll need to know um, is basically irregular bones and an irregular bone is just a bone that won't fit into one of the other categories. So we're left over with a handful of bones that aren't long, that aren't short, um, that aren't flat and aren't sesamoid. We just categorise those together as irregular bones. And obviously the function of an irregular bone is, is whatever it's there for. So it's an individualised function. Um, the one that you've got on the screen there is one of the vertebrae. And you can see it's a pretty strange, unusual shape. It's got these protrusions um, from it for different muscle attachments and so on and a hole through the middle for the central nervous system and, and a kind of a convex sorry concave shape where the discs in between the vertebrae sit so it's very very specialized or individualized so because it doesn't fit the other categories we just call that an irregular bone okay let's move on now to think about bone remodeling let's think about what it is and how it happens so when we exercise, when we jump and where we lift weights, uh, where, where we move around, whenever we do weight bearing exercise, which is the majority of exercise, um, other than things like swimming, um, whenever we do weight bearing exercise, the bones are placed under stress. And it's that stress that causes uh, tiny fractures, what we call micro fractures, um, usually on the surface of the bone, um, where the bones meet um, the tendons that attach to muscle muscle and bone attached together via tendons and micro fractures occur there um, and ultimately are then healed by the body those micro fractures don't remain um, in place they're healed and as the body heals those micro fractures over time um, the bones are made stronger so the the process of healing those micro fractures is what makes the bones stronger. They become more dense, more minerals are laid down at the site where the damage was was made, where the damage was produced on the surface of the bone. Um, typically, therefore, where most damage occurs is where the bones become strongest. And that is normally where the ligaments and particularly the tendons insert on the bone, which is ideal. Because if you think about it, that is where you want the bone to be the strongest, because that is where the bone is suffering the greatest amount of strain when your muscles contract to move your skeleton. So these sites of damage um, experience these micro fractures and over time the body will adapt as it heals these micro fractures to make those sites where the damage previously occurred to be stronger and more dense than they were. There are five stages that you'll need to know um, in the process of bone remodeling. And here on the screen, we've got a little diagram for each one um, that you can copy out if it helps. Um, but let me just briefly talk you through uh, what's happening at each stage. The first stage is the activation stage. And in the activation stage, once we've um, caused a micro trauma um, once we've caused a micro fracture to the to the lining of the bone where you can see the lining cells there on the diagram and um, the periosteum is the technical term when damage occurs there then a signal is sent um, that damage has occurred um, and in response to that signal um, arrive what what are called osteoclasts Osteoclasts, they respond to a signal from the bone that there's some kind of mechanical stress, some kind of damage at that site on the bone. That's simply the activation stage, the arrival of the osteoclasts. Now an osteoclast, um, osteo means bone and the clast part of the words means 
breaks something that breaks things down An osteoclast breaks bones down so what does the osteo what do the osteoclasts do well the second stage is the resorption stage and in the resorption stage the osteoclasts have dug a cavity so they've created an acidic environment on the lining cells of the bone and essentially burnt away um, eaten away or dug away um, at the at the surface of the bone down into the bone so in spongy bone they'll dig a cavity in compact bone it'll be more like a tunnel but at the site where the damage occurred the osteoclasts dig down break out the old bone that's to be replaced and then we get to our third stage and the third stage is the reversal stage and at this point the osteoclasts die. Okay, so the technical term for this is apoptosis, but the osteoclasts die effectively. They stop working, they're no longer functional, they, they, they die. Um, and the debris that they've created, the bits that have been broken off from the bone, have to be moved somewhere else. So the osteoclasts and all the debris needs to be shifted and moved somewhere else. And it's at the reversal stage where these pre-osteoblasts arrive um, and turn into or become osteoblasts. So initially they're, they're pre-osteoblasts, then they become just straight up, straight up old-fashioned osteoblasts. So the osteoclasts break down the bone and then the osteoblasts arrive at the reversal stage and then start to fill the bone back in. They're the bone builders, if you like. Osteoclasts, bone breakers. Osteoblasts, bone builders. So the osteoblasts line this cavity that's been dug out. They fill back in this resorption pit. And they fill it in uh, with a matrix which then is mineralized. Um, and mineralized essentially means it's hardened. It's made, made tougher than it was before. And the minerals that are that are used to make it tougher are calcium and phosphorus. So those are the two main minerals that are used by the osteoblasts um, to fill the cavity and make sure that the new bone is nice and strong and durable. They also, the osteoblasts themselves, become part of the lining cells. They become part of the periosteum of the bone. And then the fifth and final stage is the quiescence stage, where essentially we've healed the bone now. It's nice and strong. It's, it's actually more dense than it was before. There was a greater number of minerals there than there were before. Um, and although some of the osteoblasts become lining cells, some of them remain there in the new bone. And so we've got a very strong matrix structure we've got a very strong mineralized hardened bone that's much stronger than it was before and that's essentially what bone remodeling is we have weight bearing stress micro fractures occur and we go through this five stage process at the end of which we have bones which are stronger than they were before and of course from our point of view that is one of the reasons why we would recommend weight bearing exercise uh, because it helps to strengthen the bones it helps to strengthen the whole skeletal system. I hope that's been of some help to you. Thanks for watching. See you next time.